world. David Whitmer sensed the urgency and sought counsel from his family. It was in the spring during planting season. His father reminded him that he had two days work of harrowing in the, his wheat, and on top of that, fertilizer that needed to be spread immediately. He could not go unless he could get a witness from God that it was absolutely necessary. So David asked the Lord for a testimony concerning his going for Joseph and was told by the voice of the Spirit to go as soon as his wheat was harrowed in. Well, the next day he went to the field and found that he had two heavy days' work ahead of him. He said to himself that if he could in some way do the work quicker than had ever been done before, he would receive it as evidence that it was the will of God that he should do all in his power to assist Joseph Smith in the work in which he was engaged. He started to harrow in a different pattern and wound up finishing in one day what should have taken two. His father came by the field that evening and saw what had been done. He said, there must be an overruling hand in this, and I think you had better go down to Pennsylvania as soon as your plaster of Paris is spread. The next morning, David went to spread the fertilizer, which he had, had left two days earlier near his sister's house. But when he got there, he discovered the fertilizer was gone. He asked his sister, and she told him. She and her children saw three men sew the plaster the day before with remarkable skill. She thought he had hired men to do the work. David inquired among relatives and neighbors, but was unable to discover who had done the work. The family was convinced that there was an exertion of supernatural power connected with this strange occurrence. David immediately set out for Pennsylvania and retrieved Joseph and Oliver and provided a place where they could finish the translation of the Book of Mormon. And we know that David Whitmer became one of the three witnesses of the Book of Mormon. We too have the opportunity to be fully engaged in our Lord's great and marvelous work. As our offerings are received, let us consider our response to the latter-day work of sharing the gospel. May we hunger and thirst after righteousness and thrust in our sickles with our might. Shall we pray? Our Father in heaven, we praise thy name, for indeed thou art the source of all good things. And your arm is in this work and has helped in so many ways. Father, we pray that uh, you would accept these our, our gifts as tokens of our love for thee and our desire to labor for your kingdom. And we ask it in Jesus' name.
Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, in his ministry, is recorded in the uh, fifth and sixth chapters of Matthew, of the Gospel of Matthew. And then toward the end of the sixth chapter, uh, that I'll discuss more about what goes on before that, but right at the end, at the end of this commencement of his teachings on the mount, this is a, was a conclusion for that. Wherefore, seek not the things of this world, but seek ye first to build up the kingdom of God and to establish his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. May God add his blessing to the reading of this word. It was uh, 19 years ago, actually, I believe today, that my wife and I moved here from Amarillo, Texas. And we came, we felt compelled to gather to the center place. It was our hope that we would see the church set in order again. Uh, and it was and I happen to be have been privileged enough to be in the audience that day when our speaker came forth and accepted the mantle of prophet and president of the church and I see some heads nodding out there. And uh, you were there too. Uh, There's still some of us around. I have learned some things about prophets over the years that uh, when they are set apart to the office, they don't get up from that seat all knowing that just like everyone else, they learn line upon line, precept upon precept. And sometimes we're not always kind 
in our expectations of what, uh, what they are capable of doing. But over time and experience, they become much better than they were, lead us in ways that we cannot uh, have imagined. I, one of the things I admire most about our speaker is his willingness to accept that role. I cannot imagine. I know some of the difficulties that I've seen and I multiply that many, many times. And uh, it is, uh, you know, I find that the prophet and I don't always agree. Sometimes uh, we can kind of speak back and forth at each other. I mean, but I have a wife and we kind of do that sometimes. You know, and it's not much different. But he has always been my friend and we've always stood together, even when in disagreement. And I think that is the call of each one of us. He is the man that God sent to lead this people in this day. And it is my indeed pleasure to present to you President Larson. Well, thank you for those kind words, uh, Brother Stricker. Appreciate it. I appreciate the mu music from our little sister, Piper, um, because it fits so well with my theme for this evening, and you're never going to guess what it is. But anyway, I'm going to ask you a question. A question. And you know, I can be mean, I can be tough. And that question is, where were you last Thursday evening? Let me, let me see the hands that were here last Thursday evening. That's, that's not even half. Shame on you. Shame on you. The Vacation Church School put on their program. And I knew it was going on during the week, and I didn't have the opportunity to come and visit with them, which I usually do. Maybe it didn't get advertised enough. Maybe we'll have to do a better job with that. But I was impressed, deeply impressed with that program. It was excellent. There were numbers of those folks, that um, young folks, again, at this uh, vacation church school period, the four days. I think it was about 80 or something. I don't know what the final figure was, but it was, it was around 80 of those young folks. And when I sat in the back and listened and watched and observed that program, I thought of the opportunity for outreach. Because there was about 200 folks in attendance here. And I don't know how many of you raised your hands, I maybe 20 or 30. So there was a lot of parents, and grandparents, and friends of those young people. And uh, to Austin and Christine and Sister Burnett, and the whole bunch that put that program together, I say, I commend you heartily for that. And actually, it prompted for my message this evening. Because I, it told something to me. And I hope it can tell something to you. And so we go back into the sixth chapter of Matthew. And the Lord talked about, first of all, and, and praying about your alms and doing it in secret and this and that and the other thing. <clears throat> and 
suggested that our prayers not be ostentatious. He also said that it shouldn't be repetitive. Sometimes perhaps our language and the terms we use in our prayers are repetitive. We do it out of habit. Maybe we ought to think about changing that. Okay. And then when he talked about prayer to those folks, the thing that came out of it was the Lord's Prayer. He says, this is the way you pray. Pray, our Father who art in heaven, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, that is done in heaven, and et cetera, et cetera. And he gave us an example how to pray. And if any of you have difficulty praying, you use that as a model, fit it in. And he went and talked about, uh, among other things, fasting. He said, when thou fastest, anoint thy head and wash thy face. Uh, we're not prepared to do that, I guess, but maybe we should. And then he talked about lay not up for yourself treasures upon the earth. Where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. Where moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves don't break through to steal. And he said, for where your treasure is, is that where your heart is. And I don't think we have a problem with that, but we need to be sure that we understand it. And then he went on and talked about the necessities of life. He says, your heavenly Father will provide for you whatever things you need, like food, what you shall eat, and for raiment. And he says, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, nor what you shall drink, nor yet for your bodies, which you shall put in. Is not the life more than the meat. Then he talked about the fowls in the air and et cetera. You're familiar with that. And also the clothing. And so that's why he ended up with the scripture that I read. And he said, Wherefore, seek not the things of this world, in which those in the audience were concerned about his disciples and others. Seek not the things of this world, but seek ye first to build up the kingdom of God and to establish his righteousness. And all these things will just happen. He'll take care of you. Now, if any of you got your scriptures, and I presume some of you do, but I don't suspect you do, um, you know how, what the King James Version reads. You all know that? King James Version says, Seek not the things of this world, but seek ye first the kingdom of God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. There's three words that were put in there by Joseph in the inspired translation. Do you know that? How many of you know that? How many of you don't? Good bet you don't. Well, go back, get your King James Version out, and look at it. And you need to put this in here. I've got parentheses around to build up. It's in verse 33 of the King James Version. But it doesn't say in there to build up. To build up the kingdom of God and to establish his righteousness. There's a difference. And so I don't know where... Brother Austin and Christina came up with a theme for that vacation church school. The theme was, for those of you that weren't there and don't know anything about it, it was, we are kingdom builders. We are kingdom builders. I don't know if that's where you got that. <laughs> you did. Christina, is it, did you take it from that scripture? Okay, how marvelous it is. We are kingdom builders. We're going to teach those young folks about that. And so it is that 
I asked the question, I guess, when those young folks did their, did their thing. And I ask ourselves, I guess, are we, can we confess to be kingdom builders? I hope so. I hope so. Because the idea of the kingdom of God on earth is very basic to our restoration belief. And in particular, I think, to the remnant church and the challenge of building a kingdom. And I always go back to section 65. For some, some that think, you know, want to discuss what, what, they have, what the kingdom of God is about. Why it's important to us, what we need to be about it. And in section 65, even though it was entitled uh, the Revelation on Prayer, it goes in and says something that we all need to be aware of. Um, the Revelation goes like this. The, kingdoms, the keys of the kingdom of God are committed unto man on the earth, and from thence shall the gospel roll forth until the ends of the earth as a stone which is cut out of the mountain. Without hand shall roll forth until it has filled the whole earth. And by the way, when that, that's one of the prophecies of Jesus that indeed when the gospel has gone into all the earth, something's going to happen. Something's going to happen. He says he's coming back. Yea, a voice crying, prepare ye the way of the Lord, prepare ye the supper of the Lamb, make ready for the bridegroom. That's been our challenge. It's been our commission. Pray unto the Lord and call upon his holy name and make known his wonderful works among the people. Call upon the Lord that his kingdom may go forth upon the earth. Joseph the prophet revealed that in these last days. That the inhabitants thereof may receive it and they may be prepared for the days to come in which the Son of Man shall come down in heaven. Clothed in the brightness of his glory to meet the kingdom of God which is set upon the earth. There it is, folks. That's the promise. Wherefore, may the kingdom of God go forth that the kingdom of heaven may come. That thou, O God, may be glorified in heaven so on earth that thy enemies may be subdued. For thine is the honor and the power and the glory forever and ever. And so we understand that God said to the last days, and the movement for which we are part of, that we should build a kingdom here, because until the kingdom is built here, and we, can, we know because in the Doctrine and Covenants, Joseph also said that the kingdom of God is indeed the very Zion. So we can equate those two together. And another scripture of interest comes from the 19th chapter of Matthew. And the Pharisees were tempting Christ and, and some other things going on there. But also, this is one also that was associated, I think, with what I was seen with those young folks last Thursday night. And if you recall, this has to do with the children. And then there were brought unto him, Jesus, little children, that he should put his hands on them and pray. And I wished, actually, that I could have done that with those young folks. I was so impressed with what they had learned and what they were committed to. And the disciples rebuked, rebuked them. saying there is no need for Jesus hath said such shall be saved. But Jesus said, Suffer little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. Now, something else in that 13th verse, the inspired version in the 19th chapter of Matthew. Little children are brought to him that he should put his hands on them and pray. And the disciples rebuked them. 
Now get out your King James again because the phrase that the prophet Joseph inserted in here and the disciples rebuked them saying there is no need for Jesus hath said such shall be saved. That is not in the King James Version. And there's a difference. So anyway, uh, that's an important point. Suffer the little children to come unto me or is such as the kingdom of God. And then the other challenge that comes in the work of the restoration movement and uh, of course this, this will happened in uh, 1834 in Kirtland. Um, and again this had to do with stewardship. And again a commandment I give unto you concerning your stewardship which I have appointed unto you. Behold all these properties are mine. This had to do with the United Order which had been formed and then they had difficulty and then he says disband it. So he had properties to deal with. Behold all these properties are mine or else your faith is vain and ye are found hypocrites and the covenants which ye made unto me are broken. And if the properties are mine then ye are stewards otherwise ye are no stewards. But verily I say unto you I have appointed unto you to be stewards over mine house, even stewards indeed. And for this purpose, I have commanded you to organize yourselves, even to Shinalah, that word means to print, to print my words, the fullness of my scriptures, the revelations which I have given to you, and which I shall hereafter from time to time give unto you. And what I've got written here in my margin that says something about re our revelations. So he's continue, continuing to give direction to his people also with regard to stewardship. And we know where what that has led us to our understanding of consecration and tithing. Which I shall hereafter from time to time give unto you for the purpose of building up my church and kingdom on the earth. Well, I'll say, maybe not say anything about the equality of the church and the kingdom and the separation and all that, but anyway, that's something else. For the purpose of building up my church and kingdom on the earth and to prepare my people for the time when I shall dwell with them which is nigh at hand. Now this was in 1834. That's a lot of years ago. But I think it applies directly to us this day. And if I may be so bold, which I'm going to do, uh, to read uh, something from uh, the Doctrine and Covenants, which um, stops at 144 for us but section 147 uh, has some words that uh, I consider to be uh, revelation to the people even though it came in in, 18, in 1964 it says and it's, it's, it, it is revelatory and prophetic it says stewardship is the response of my people to the ministry of my son and is required alike of all those who seek to build a kingdom. I believe that, and I think hopefully you believe it. It's a response to the ministry of my son required alike of all those who seek to build a kingdom. Now, are we all agreed that perhaps we're kingdom builders? All right, well, be aware of stewardship. Now, the back to the back to Thursday night. 
if you'll allow me to do that. I got a few minutes, okay. There was a young fellow that sat at that piano. I don't know how old he is, 17, I guess. He's a senior in high school. He's homeschooled. And he and his parents attend the, an outreach program over there at the old Inglewood Church. They minister on a Sunday morning to handicapped and disabled people. I also had discussion with him and mentioned to him that in that church out there in Inglewood, I don't know if they let know that, our, that RLDS church is still there, that's where Mary and I were married 64 years ago. <laughs> anyway, I'm glad they're using, putting to good use. But he composed a song and the words that just touched me something else. And when I heard those young folks sing that, that with the words, and we had them up on the screen, I think Austin and Christine thought it was so important. I don't know, Lender, whoever it was, <laughs> those folks, put it up on the screen so we could follow along with the words. And you missed out on something. Now, the young man is apparently is going <laughs> to copyright that, those words and, and that music that he composed to it. He's a very, very talented musician, pianist. And, and I thought, you know, he's, he's with us. Because everything, those words, I think, were so important. I'm just going to read that, the lyrics to that. I'm not going to sing it. But I will tell you this, that how many of you get on, can get on the website? How many of you get on the website and look around what's going on? How many of you look up the Remnant Church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints? How many of you know where to find live stream? Everybody, you better get get with it, all of you. And when you go when you go home, get into there, get on the internet, look, type in the Remnant Church of Jesus Christ, um, and get up the website and hit that live stream and go in there. That program is on there. That program is on there. Although, I don't know how many you had on the stage, but 50 or 60 something must have been there. But anyway, and they, they did their singing all in a group, the whole group. And then they divided off and did different ones after that. But the first three songs, these were the words that, were, that those young folks sang. And I believe that they understood what it was about when they were taught in that vacation church school. The lyrics that this young man, Wyatt Fears, wrote, in this world that we live, in it's hard to keep our spirits clean. There's good, bad, right, and wrong, and everything in between. I guess we agree with that. But we will continue in the things which God has said. That's the word in the scriptures. We will work to build his kingdom. Christian, lay, lift your head. Sometimes it's easy to say, all hope is lost. But never lose that hope, too great would be the cost. We read in the scriptures the plan God has for us. And I guess you taught those young folks the plan. Is that right? <laughs> we will answer the call. We will never fall. We will never lose hope because... We are kingdom builders. We live for God and Son. We draw our strength from the Holy Spirit. And that strength makes us one. Now, if you remember, there was some, one of our revelations talked about strength for us in unity. We will set our eyes on the task to be done. We are kingdom builders, each and every one. The Lord has planned for his people of latter days. They will build a Zion, the holy city they will raise. Keep the faith, repent, and wait for the Lord's return is at hand. He got all the bases covered in this thing he did. 
Sharpen your knowledge, join the cause, and sing with the angels' man. The devil will attack us, saying, Give in to me. But we will not succumb to his evil, and it's guaranteed. And that was also counsel to this remnant church. We read in the scriptures the plan God has for us. We will answer the call. We'll never fall. We will never lose hope because, and then repeat the chorus, we are kingdom builders. Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. The victory is ours because of Christ's great sacrifice. Love God and love your neighbor. Keep the commandments because we're kingdom builders, each and every one. And when they got to the finale with that last chorus, I mean, you know, they essentially raised the roof. And what I thought, I thought if in our singing, in our congregational singing, we could emulate that, we could do that with that feeling and that spirit that those young folks did here, man, that would be great. We need to, we need to do that, brothers and sisters. We need to do that. Anyway, there was lots of enthusiasm and excitement in that. We need to raise our voices and raise our hand. I'm just going to mention a few things with regard to the kingdom that I picked up from the various sources that I have available and some of the materials that are available. Evan Fry's book and to all of us, um, some of the fundamentals and some from the ministry of uh, the sermons for, for ministry outreach. And so let me just read some of these to you. From the beginning of our history, Latter-day Saints have believed that one of the major tasks of the building of the church is the building of the kingdom of God. Okay? Gradually, you know, the early saints came to recognize that the idea of personal salvation which was understood by all that was going on around, even back in the late 1700s, early 1800s, the idea of personal salvation. And we hear that with the major denominations this day. Just confess that Jesus is your savior and all is well. Personal salvation must give way the early saints began to understand that, and I trust that we do too. Early saints came to recognize the idea of personal salvation must give way to the idea of world redemption, and that no man must think of his own salvation apart from the extension of the reign of God into the lives of others. There is, aside from what we talk about, the literal kingdom on earth, which involves things, the temporal aspects, if you will, um, things that we deal with every day. There is a spiritual component to the kingdom of God, to be sure. The kingdom of God does not consist of policies or programs, schemes or laws, but of people but of people. The first movement for all of us is to change the minds and hearts and character of men. We call that conversion. We try to convert the hearts and minds of people. It's an obligation that you and I have to society. When that happens, policies, programs, schemes, laws become in place. It's only a means to an end. The kingdom, self, and others. The building of the kingdom of God is a controlling objective of the remnant church's corporate life. You have your relationship with God. 
expect most everyone here has had that covenant in the waters of baptism and have been blessed with the gift of the Holy Ghost. The abiding comforter that comes into place when the Lord asks, Come unto me, all ye that are heavy laden and labor, and I will give you rest. You know that. And I think most of us have experienced that at some time. But goodness knows there's so much that goes on around us uh, that bears upon us. Because I do believe that we live in a day of time of chaos, of tribulation. And that's why the theme, I think, for this year has been selected to prepare for my coming. Because we don't know how long the Lord's going to put up with all this foolishness. The purpose of God for man, the purpose of God for man is righteousness. And I think that's going to be spoken of some more in, this, in the reunion component of this week. The purpose of God for man is righteousness. The purpose of God for society, the world, is his kingdom. The two belong together. The purpose of God for humanity is that all men living together in his kingdom on the basis of righteousness. Sometimes I think about the inclusiveness or the exclusiveness of that kingdom. I sometimes think about the inclusiveness or the exclusiveness of the body of Christ, known as the remnant church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We all know that there are good people in churches that say, just open it to all. Open communion, open baptize, everybody come. Because Jesus did say, come unto me, all ye that are heavy laden in labor, etc. He did say it, didn't he? We know that there are good people who regard church and the kingdom as exclusive and who would keep out undesirables by setting petty stringent tests of doctrinal belief and ecclesiastical practice. We got to be careful. We got to be careful because there are elements of both. There are elements of both. We do know one thing, that straight is a gate and narrow is the way. And there, there are requirements. There are requirements for membership in the kingdom. And uh, I'm not going to list those, you know, based on this idea of righteousness. And so just let me close this evening with something I thought was inspired by what happened up here last Thursday. You folks that weren't there missed it. It was a marvelous thing. And I'm seeing more and more of our young men who have been called into the priesthood to fill in for those of us that are going to eventually shuffle off the mortal coil. Some of them sitting right over there, a couple of them. I saw three young men up on the podium this morning in Blue Springs. Offered invocation, benediction, offertory. And especially the moments with the ironic, ironic moments. Sometimes I get mixed up with moments with the master. And I'll put a plug in for that. So I embarrass you again? No. I know probably half of you don't subscribe to Moments of the Master. You need to get it. You need to use it every day. There's always some thought in there that's helpful. Okay. The challenge for us 
Are we truly kingdom builders? I believe sincerely we are. And I just thank God for those efforts, for those folks that did that vacation church school, is which is when I saw all those people here, if I could just get all those folks to, to join us in building the kingdom. And I just wonder what, you know, those young folks that were singing that and the, that theme for the year, talking with their parents or their grandparents about kingdom building. I just wonder how interesting that must have been. But let us, let us continue with, as adults, understanding what lies before us, that truly the kingdom is something that has to be built. And let us continue to understand how we need to do that. And you see, Jesus, in, in all his ministry, really never defined it point blank. He never did. He talked about all the characteristics of us, with parables and all those kinds of things. But it has come to our lot here at the end of the dispensations of time for us to understand that kingdom of God that's to be built here on the earth. And indeed, may it happen soon. When we get to the point, I'm not sure we're going to get to the conclusion of all of it because it's probably an ongoing, it's an ongoing building. But I believe that at some point, the Lord will say, there are sufficient numbers of my people who can claim to be a righteous people. And then they shall be gathered. And the Lord shall come and be with us. May it be see, may it be so, may it be so. Amen. In our worship this morning, I was sitting next to a young deacon that was quite nervous, and he got up to do the offertory, and when he got done, he came back and sat down, and he left his hymnal on the pulpit. He didn't know it. I just happened to see, and he was sitting next to me, and so when we sang the closing hymn, I was prepared to share my hymnal with him. After the service, he uh, thanked me for that, and he was quite embarrassed because he was young. Uh, and I said, well, that's what the other guys back here do is we help cover for one another. Now, some of you may have noticed, I was sitting in the same chair as Austin, and he passed me a note earlier that said that uh, we have a mismatch on the closing hymn. What it says and uh, the number that is there, they don't match. Uh, it's supposed to be 373. Can you do that? I thought you could. I thought you could. Another favorite with a steadfast faith.
name of our Lord and beloved Savior Jesus Christ. May that gracious spirit that has blessed us throughout this day be with each of you until we are privileged to meet in his name once again. Amen.